Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time of the year. Now bless our time together tonight. May we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. In thy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Didn't the choir do a good job this morning? We're thankful for that. And uh, they're going to come sing a little bit more tonight. A manger in Bethlehem held Mary's little lamb. Then a cross on Golgotha held the nails that pierced his hands. Then Satan said, I've won, I told him. The grave said, I'll hold him. And death said, he's mine forevermore. For three days and nights, oh, hell had a jubilee. But just as dawn was breaking, Satan thought he'd check and see. And the grave said, I can't find him. And death said, I could not find him. He got up, and when he left, he took my key.
are three wise men who are following a star Traveling to Bethlehem from Eastern land so far They heard about a birth there, an anointed holy one Born to be Messiah, God's only begotten son Descending on that bright and starry night Shepherds came to see that child beneath the stars so bright That baby in a manger in the little Jewish town Here one, one day will this universe, universe creation, creation will bow down, down. Together in fellowship. Buford, I think you danced on that one right there. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Wonderful. Let's sing that chorus. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Once again, go tell it on the mountain, 
over the hills and everywhere go telling them about and that Jesus Christ is born. One more time, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere go. Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. All right, go ahead, be seated. Praise the Lord. So glad to have each and every one of you here tonight. Uh, we just had a great time this morning and uh, so thankful. The choir did a wonderful job. I think we need to give them one more big round of applause. But they did such a wonderful job. And then also Brother Tom uh, does a phenomenal job here uh, with the youth, but does, does a great job with the choir as well. So thankful. And all these musicians, I'm telling you, choir, uh, choir music is not easy, but Christmas choir music. We'll move on. Praise the Lord. And I tell you, it's hard stuff, but so thankful for them. Uh, of course, this was our night that we had, but we had postponed uh, for the children's Christmas program. We'll be doing that at a later date, so make sure uh, that uh, we may just have Christmas in July. We may have Christmas in January. We may have Christ Christmas some other time, but it'll be all right. Praise the Lord. Uh, Christ is always the reason anyway. But uh, we're so thankful for that. Our Christmas Eve service that is going to be coming up. We want to make it abundantly clear. We do not have Sunday school next Sunday morning. We're doing our 11 a.m. only service. And then we'll be not having our Sunday evening service for Christmas Eve. So next week we'll be only having an 11 a.m. service. And then the following week we'll be having our Sunday school 11 a.m. And then we'll be coming about 11.30 to do some prayer time and we'll have a wonderful time uh, with the fireworks. I'm telling you uh, it, I'm excited about what we were able to do with that and then to make sure that you remember this Wednesday if you've signed up to be able to be a part of the Christmas the church wide Christmas party we'll be having that over in the gymnasium at 6.30 so come out and be a part of that and then of course Dr. Harper always wants me to make, to make sure you remind you that we'll be having Bible college classes coming up January the 11th. We're starting at Genesis the very beginning and uh, these classes will be absolutely free. So if you'd like to come and be a part of these classes, make sure you come out and be a part of that. Men, let's go ahead and come and receive our tithes and offering. While they're coming, I want to read this card. Oh, we do. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you reminded me of that. We need cookies for Wednesday. Hallelujah. Um, chocolate chip, macadamia nut, uh, whatever you can think of. Peanut butter. Praise the Lord. Uh, Oreos? Is that somebody said Oreos? Praise God! So come on, bring some of those. Uh, bring some of those cookies. We'll have a wonderful time with our cookies and cocoa. This card it says, "Thank you." There are, are not enough words to express how thankful we are for the beautiful flowers, the wonderful food, and most of all, your prayers in our time of sorrow. Jeff and Audrey Minix at the passing of his father, and we're so thankful that we know, like that song we sang this morning, that we know, boy, what a Christmas he is having. Uh, those that have already passed on, we're so thankful for that. Again, we'll receive our tithes and offering. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to come to your house, to be able to, to do, Lord, exactly what you have asked us to do, Lord, to give back. And Lord, I pray that you would just touch the giver. I pray that you'd bless them, bless them abundantly. God, I know that uh, we've tried you, and we cannot outgive you. And Lord, we're thankful that you have done great and mighty things in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you just touch those, the, the, the givers. Lord, I pray that you'd multiply it, use it for your honor and your glory. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen and amen. Don't forget now Wednesday night, and we're going to have a great time over the Fellowship Hall, or the Gymnasium, Life Family Center, whatever you want to call it. I won't ever forget we was trying to pay the debt off, and somebody come up to me and said, are we really going to let people 
and young people play ball over there in that gym. I said, sir, as soon as we can open the door, we're going to play ball in the gym. Most people build a gym to play ball in. And uh, praise God, I'm glad we've got a gym to play ball in. Don't get me started. But anyway, that's about like saying, if you've got a car, you're going to drive it. But uh, we're going to have a wonderful time, and we're going to have a lot of good food, a lot of fun, a lot of fellowship. Uh, we've got a sleigh ride with no sleigh, with no snow. And uh, we got the Cannonball Express, our own private Twitch Railroad train that runs through here. Man, if you're going to talk it up, talk it up big. Amen? And then we're going to have snow no matter what it's doing outside. Now, you can't beat that. Amen? And uh, But Christmas only comes once a year. And uh, we don't want to be redundant. But that song they sang this morning, when I heard it last year, Miss Sandy Blythe, she wrote several of the songs we've done for Christmas. But when I heard that, I said, man we got to do that one again. Little did I know it would mean more to me this year than ever before. But can you just imagine what people are seeing in heaven? Makes me think of a song somebody sang years ago. Wish you were here. This is such a beautiful place. And I've never seen heaven from that side. Somebody asked Talbot Moore. They said, Dr. Moore, do people, do people really sing and shout in heaven? He said, I don't know I ain't been yet. But I do know this, a lot of people left here doing it. And so thank God for that hope we have. So I want them to do what they did this morning. Thank you for being willing to change in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. But just think about somebody that's in heaven, their first Christmas there. What we've dreamed about, what we've read about, what we've meditated about, our, what we've had faith in, it's now in sight, and they see it. And I believe this song will be a help and an encouragement to you. On earth we said our goodbyes when the Father called me away, the angels came to greet me, and they carried me through heaven's gates. And I know you often miss me, especially at this time. the king my ears heard the angels sing on earth you could never imagine what Christmas is like in heaven it's beyond your farthest dreams if you could see as you tie your gifts with gold ribbon, I'm walking upon golden streets. As you light your Christmas candle, the Lamb is the light here for me. I've talked with Mary and Joseph, and they have many memories to share. All the shepherds and the wise men have stories of their own to tell. If you could see what I see, if you could see what I see. You 
the face of the King. My ears heard the angels sing. Although you could never imagine what Christmas is like in heaven. Not a blessing tonight. Psalm 116. Last Sunday morning we began preaching from Psalm 116 and verse 1 where the psalmist decried, I love the Lord. And again, let me say, when you say I love the Lord, there's nothing else left to say. You've said it all. And in the text he gives the reason why he loves the Lord his response to loving the Lord and the rejoicing that comes with loving our wonderful Lord. I only got through verse 1 and verse 2 last Sunday when we looked at so many reasons why we love the Lord. In verse 1 and verse 2, we look at what he has done. And I want to read carefully verses 1 down through verse 7. And I want you just to realize what the Lord has done for us. I'll not spend much time with the first one because we preached on that, but we will move along. He said in verse 1 and 2, He loved the Lord because He has heard and answered our prayer. He said in verse 1, He hath heard my supplication, my voice, Verse 2, he hath inclined his ear unto me. I'm glad tonight we have a reason because he has done that for us. He hath heard our voice. He hath inclined to us. I'm really interested tonight in verse number 3. I love the way the psalmist words this. Look what he said in verse 3. The sorrows of death come past me. The pains of hell get hold upon me. And I felt trouble and sorrow. And all of us tonight that's lived in this world long enough will have to admit we have dealt with our sorrows. We have dealt with our pain. And a lot of times we have found trouble. We have found sorrow. It happens to all of us. I wish we could all go to heaven without the hardships the disappointments and the setbacks of life. But I don't think any child of God has ever made it to heaven escaping the difficulties, the fiery trials of our faith. But notice in verse 4, verse 3, when he felt the sorrow and he endured the pain, verse 4, he said, Then I called upon the name of the Lord. 
He cries in desperation in verse 4, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Skip down to verse number 6. Look what the Lord has done. The Lord preserveth the simple. And he said, I was brought low. And I'm telling you, there'll be times in our life we're going to be brought low. But notice what he did in verse number 6. I was brought low, and he helped me. I wonder if there's anybody in this room tonight, God has helped you. Yes, I'm glad he hath heard our cry. I'm glad he hath inclined his ear. But I'm glad we can say he hath helped me. I love what the psalmist says over again, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. And I'm glad he helped me. Aren't you glad for the night the help we find in the Word of God, in the presence of God, in the peace of God, in the joy of God, in the person of God. He's the God who helps us. And as though it couldn't get any better, he goes on to verse 7 and says, Return unto the rest, O my soul, here it is now, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. Anybody here, the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. I'm glad he has not dealt with me on the basis of what I deserve. I was visiting the hospital several years ago and there was a dear man. He was very distraught at the condition of his wife. And he was standing there in the hallway and he was weeping and he said, I don't understand this. And I said, sir, I don't either. He said, I, I don't like this. I said, sir, I don't either. He said, I don't think this is fair. I said, sir, I don't either. He said, I don't see any good that can come out of this. And I said, sir, I don't either. And he looked at me and he said, she doesn't deserve this. And the only thing I could say that that distraught man was this. My brother, all of us ought to be thankful that God has not dealt with us on the basis of what we deserve. He hath dealt bountifully with me. That word bountifully means no measure, no borders, no limitations, no way to contain it and no way to explain it. The blessings that God has dealt with you and I. Hearing our prayer, inclining his ear, helping us, and then dealing bountifully with us. And when it looks like it can't get any better, look what he says in verse number 8. For thou hast delivered my body from death. Did I read that right? Thou hast delivered my flesh from death. No, thou hast delivered my soul from death. Glory. Our bodies may get weak and diseased and return to the dust from which they came. But I'm glad there's a place where the soul never dies. There's a little simple song in your church hymnal. It probably wouldn't win any awards with the song critics of our day. In fact, most song critics of our day have never even written a song. But I love the little song, To Canaan's Land, I'm on my way, where the soul of man never dies. Our bodies may get frail, our bodies may get weak. They may go by the way of the grave, but I love him because what he has done, he has delivered our soul from death 
I'm glad there is a part of you and I that will not go to the grave. It will not go to the cemetery. It will not return to the ashes. I'm glad there's a part of you and I that will live forever. And it's not these old vile bodies. You say, what is it? It is the very valuable soul of man. When God made the heavens and God made the earth and he made the flowers and the trees and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fishes of the sea, he made a man. And as far as I can tell, in the six days of creation, he did something for that man that he didn't do for the flowers and the trees and the rocks and the hills and the oceans and even the kitty catties and the poodle dog. It said that he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. and Man became a living soul. And that living soul is so valuable, Jesus said, what shall a man give in exchange for it? And I've heard this said all my life, and I know what they mean, and I've said it before to the Lord showed me something. I've even said it before, I believe. I don't know what in the world God's seen in us worth saving. I understand the humility of that statement. I appreciate the lowly meekness of that statement. But according to the word of God tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you what God saw in me and what God saw in you and what God saw in every living human being worth saving. And that is that soul that he ignited by the eternal flame of his own power that was made in the image of God that was marred by sin. That's exactly what God saw that was worth saving. And I'm glad he has saved my soul. And I'm glad he hath delivered our soul from death. If you don't think it could get any better, look at verse 8. Mine eyes from tears. Aren't you glad tonight he is the God who wipes away our tears? I'm glad when the sorrow comes and the tears stream out of our face, I'm glad he helps us. He delivers us. Our soul from death and our eyes from tears. Boy, I love verse number eight, the last part. And my feet from falling. I don't want you to look down on yourself tonight, but I wonder how many would admit you would have fallen a long time ago. But somebody strong and near and dear was helping you and delivering you has delivered my feet from falling. When I read this text, I thought about my dear departed friend, Brother Clarence Inslee. I really wish some of you newcomers could have met Brother Clarence. He was just a man of God. A man of God that was anointed of God, seeing the glory down. I'll never forget one Wednesday night he was filling in for me and he was preaching against cigarettes and he had a special name for them and every young person liked to died in him preaching on them cigarettes and we'll talk about that later. But Brother Inslee had several songs that were just, I don't know, it, they just fit him. I can hear him now singing, were you there when they crucified my Lord. I can hear him do that part. Sometimes, sometimes it causes me to tremble and wave that hand and shake that leg and it was a blessing. I don't think Fanny Crosby herself could sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine better than Papa Inslee. But that was an old gospel song that Teddy Huffman and the Jims 
made popular in the late 70s. And I am telling you, Brother Ensley had it down. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. And he was wider than anybody in this room, but whoa, he had some soul, brother. When he'd do that, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. He'd say the mountains are too high and the valleys are too wide, but down on my knees is where I learn to stand. And I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I wonder if there's anybody tonight agrees with that song and agrees with our text tonight. Brother, we can't even walk without him holding our hand. I'm glad he hath delivered our soul from death and our eyes from tears and our feet from falling. And notice the very next verse. Boy, I just saw this. It just thrilled my heart. Verse 9 says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And the only reason why we can walk before the Lord is because he hath delivered our feet from falling. So in these verses, he gives the reason why he loves the Lord. Reason number one is because of what he has done. What has he done? He hath heard our supplication. He has heard our voice. He hath inclined his ear. He hath helped us. He has delivered us so many reasons. Reason number one is because of what he has done. But I want to close with this one tonight. Go to verse number five. As he's dealing with the reasons of loving the Lord, he not only gives us the reason, number one, what he has done. But verse number five, he gives us the reason for who he is. And can I just say, we ought to love the Lord tonight for what he's done. But more than loving the Lord, what he has done, Honey, it's time to love the Lord for who he is. Because you know what? Whether he does anything or not, he is still who he is. And I love what he's done. I'm appreciative of what he's done. I'm thankful for what he's done. But my heart tonight rejoices more in the fact of what he's done. I'm glad for who he is. And can I say tonight, based on who he is, man, we all not to have any problem loving him. Look in verse number five. In verse number five, he gives a threefold description of the person of God. In verse five, he gives a threefold description of who he is. And may I say who he is, determines what he is and what he does. Look at the threefold description in verse number five. I underline them, and I think the first one's pretty evident. You ready? Gracious is the Lord. You know who he is tonight. He's the gracious God of heaven. Gracious is the Lord. You realize tonight everything that God has done for us is based on His grace. Every move of God towards depraved mankind is based in the grace of God. I believe we all tonight believe the Bible when it says we're saved by grace. Paul said he was thankful for the sufficient grace of God. And the greatest Christian that ever lived outside of Christ himself, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And I believe the reason why tonight we're still standing and we're not consumed is God's been gracious to us. What is the grace of God? It is God's unmerited favor toward you and I. I've often heard people say there is no real definition of grace. I've got one. 
I've got a Bible definition of grace. Hebrews 2, verse number 9. He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And if a Calvinist says he is a grace preacher and he doesn't believe or preach that Christ died for everybody, he is not a grace preacher. He is an imposter because the Bible said he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's grace. Let me tell you what's not grace. Brother Roy, you had three children. You had two sons, I mean, sorry, you had two daughters and a son. Let me tell you what, what is not grace. Two of those children can be saved, but one of them's got to go to hell. Or two of the kids can be saved, or one can be saved, but one of them three, no way. Jesus didn't die for that one. The Holy Spirit's not calling that one. That one's got to go to hell. I want to tell you, that is not the grace of God. The grace of God is Mandy can be saved and Michelle can be saved and Shane needs to be saved. That's the grace of God. I have three sisters. My daddy had four children, went to Bible college, worked two jobs, and pastored a little church. They had the philosophy, if they would keep Brother J.B. poor, God would keep him humble. And my dad never filled out a portfolio. He never filled out a resume. And he never asked anybody what the package was going to be. He loved the Lord and served him faithfully. And can you imagine my daddy having four children and only one of them could be saved or all three of them could be saved, but that one, no matter what happened, he just couldn't be saved. That is not the grace of God. The grace of God is daddy can be saved and mama can be saved and Junior and Sissy and Bubba and Gomer and Andy and Laurel Lee Hobbs can be saved if they will accept Christ. Gracious is the Lord. Anybody here tonight glad for the grace of God? Why do we love the Lord? How can we not love the Lord? He has poured his grace upon us. Look at the second description of God in verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, number 2, say it with me, and righteous. Can I just say this tonight in plain old country language? There ain't nothing wrong with God. There's nothing out of sorts. There's nothing that's broken. There's nothing that needs to be fixed. There's nothing that needs to be improved. He's just right. And therefore, his throne is righteous. His word is righteous. His power is righteous. His name is righteous. His city is righteous. He is the righteous God. God can't do nothing but right. There is no sin. There is no guile. There is no imperfection. Our God is righteous. And he will reign in righteousness. I love him because he's gracious. I love him because he's righteous. But look at the third description in verse 5. Oh, I want to just stay here a minute. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God. Listen to this. Say it with me. Is merciful. You're looking for a reason to love the Lord? Look at what he's done. You're looking for a reason to love the Lord? Look at who he is. He is gracious. He is righteous. But oh, thank God, he's merciful. He is a God of mercy. And how many times have you and I 
had nothing to claim but the mercy of God. There's been times all I could say was, Oh God, have mercy upon me. And I'm glad tonight that my life, my family, my future, everything that I love and hold dear and call precious rests tonight in the hands of the merciful God. I'm glad he is full of mercy. The psalmist picked that up one day and said it's because of the mercies of the Lord that were not consumed. The writer said the mercy of God is as fresh as the dew that kisses the flowers in the morning. And I'm glad our God is full of mercy. He is the merciful God of heaven. And the reason why we love him is because of his mercy. God has had mercy upon you and I. You say, well, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Well, grace gave us what we did not deserve and that's salvation but mercy kept us from getting what we do deserve and that's judgment thank God for mercy I love the old song how many times have I bowed before God to ask his forgiveness for some wrong I have done And how many times have I heard the Lord say, Child, as long as I have mercy, you're forgiven today. I was a sinner just struggling along when God's hand of mercy reached down from heaven's throne. And there at the altar I bowed so depressed, but God gave me mercy when my sin I confess. I believe the greatest demonstration of mercy in the Bible is when that prodigal came and fell before that father and said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father, but the father said, Bring the best robe. Bring the fatted calf. Bring the ring. Bring the shoes. And then he made a statement that's better than the robe and the ring and the calf and the shoes. Oh, Brother Joe, what could be better than the ring and the robe and the calf and the shoes when he said, This my son. He was dead, but he's alive again. That's the greatest definition of mercy that I know of in the Bible. I have sinned against heaven. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son, but the Father called him son anyway because he is a God that is merciful to you and I. I believe the second greatest example of mercy in the Bible is in the book of Ruth. When Naomi left and sojourned in Moab for 10 long years, and her name Naomi means pleasant and kind, and after the Lord dealt bitterly with her, she came back to Bethlehem, Judea, in the field of harvest time, and they said, is this Naomi? She said, that's not my name anymore. My name is Mara. It's no longer pleasant. It's no more gaiety. There's no more celebrating. My name is not... Naomi, it's Mara, which means bitter, because the hand of the Almighty afflicted me, and God has dealt bitterly with me. Don't even call me that name anymore. But I've never read in the book of Ruth. I've never read in any of the book of the Bible, even in the genealogy. I've never read it where she was ever called Mara. She was always called Naomi because of the mercy of Almighty God. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe when we get to heaven we're going to see anybody 
parading around in their denominational religious legal garb, boasting and bragging how they got to heaven. But I believe there'll be a multitude worshiping God before the Lamb of God by the mercies of God we've made it to glory. Do you love the Lord tonight? I love the Lord. When you say I love the Lord, you've said it all. And what is the reason? For what he has done. What is the reason? For who he is. Who is he tonight? He's gracious. He's righteous. And he's merciful. Our Father, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, when you came in the manger, you revealed your righteousness. Lord, I'm glad when you died upon the cross, you revealed your mercy. And thank God when you got up out of that tomb, you offered grace to every sinner. Lord, may we say with this psalmist tonight, I love the Lord. Thank you for hearing our cry. Thank you for delivering our soul. Thank you for what you have done. But most of all tonight, Lord, we bless you for who you are. You're worthy. In Jesus' name. And all of